unlimited funding for three brand new offices in federal law enforcement charged solely with hunting down Americans suspected of planning to influence, of course, our own government. All they have to do is cook up any reason to suspect that we may use violence and we are fair game for targeting. And if these become law, you don't have to actually do anything to get caught up in this law enforcement web. Any indication that you're trying to influence government and anything said or seen that could imply that you're thinking of physically doing something about it. So if you buy a plane ticket to D.C. for a protest, for example, or if you're photographed ever holding a gun, they just need something they can hold up and say, this person may be violent in the future and their investigations and preventative actions may begin. And we have identical bills in the House and the Senate, one of them co-sponsored by pretty much the entire damn Democratic Party in the House that would create not one, not two, but three new federal agencies dedicated to those efforts. So do you really want to live in a country where if you express a combination of political frustration and depression online, the cops will come knocking on your door suspecting you of future crime? Because the office in charge of facilitating that is being created right now in the Department of Homeland Security. And that facilitation is coming with funding. I am so damn tired of being lied to. I don't think I can deny it anymore. You can stick to your story if you think. Hello, my friend, and thank you for listening to the 237th episode of Congressional Dish. I'm your host, Jennifer Briney. If this is your first time listening to this podcast, this is a show about Congress, but I am not a creature of the Capitol. I'm an American. I am a taxpayer, and that is the only political label that I embrace. I simply just want to know what the lawmakers are doing, not what they're saying, not their campaign slogans. I don't care about politics. I want to know what they're actually doing while in office with my money and in my name and how it affects me. So (laughs) that's the big picture of what I'm doing here. And this episode is really the final in a three-part series. It's a group of episodes that I didn't originally intend to be a part of a three-part series, but it just happened that way. So the first episode that launched me down the rabbit hole was Congressional Dish 235, Safe Haven for Sanctions Evaders, which, spoiler alert, is us. Well, in that episode, we examined international sanctions, which are weapons of economic war that we use against countries who we want to change in some way. Often we seek the replacement of their government, so either the humans in charge of it or often the structure of the government itself. And so the rabbit hole I thought I was going down was an international foreign policy rabbit hole. But in the hearings about how we use our weapons of economic war and how the targets get around them, I was shocked and surprised to hear how much of the conversation was centered around American targets, Americans being labeled as domestic terrorists. So much of that conversation was in relation to January 6th, the day that then President Donald Trump illegally hosted the Save America rally. Time to coincide with the congressional certification of the election results. Results that his ego drove him to lie about to this day because God forbid he ever admit that he lost anything. Well, after lying for months saying that he won the election, a lie that was aided by the Republican Party propagandists at Fox News and other Republican Party devoted media outlets, well, a mob of deceived people thinking that Congress was in the middle of stealing an election a mob of people led by the president of the United States to think that Congress was orchestrating a coup against him. Well, those people that believed it rioted and entered the Capitol building, which was made possible by a Capitol police force that had never trained for the possibility. Well, those rioters beat police officers and damaged the property and delayed the election certification for a few hours while the building was cleared. That event, to this day, is being branded by the Democratic Party and their propagandists in corporate media as an insurrection and the participants domestic terrorists. Now, I feel that I have already made my case for why branding what happened that day in insurrection is inaccurate, both in media and in impeachment. 
And it's dangerous because it's being used to justify an expansion of law enforcement authorities. Now, that's what this year's impeachment episode and the last main episode, the Capitol riot one, those episodes were examining those events and making my case. So going forward, (laughs) I just think that we need to go forth from a place where we acknowledge that that's the reality that I'm operating out of. And if you don't already agree with those statements, please go back and listen to those two episodes to hear me make that case. I put links to both of them in the show notes for you. And after listening to them, if you don't agree that insurrection is inaccurate and dangerous, that's okay. We don't have to agree, but you should just know that that's where I'm coming from. But coming out of that examination today, we're going to talk about why the domestic terrorist part of that propaganda is even more dangerous than the insurrection branding because it's being used to justify investigations of citizens without warrants. It's being used to punish criminals more harshly, and it's being used to rationalize a reorganization of our government to facilitate more integrations of private companies into our government's law enforcement operations. That reorganization is happening right now. And I didn't know about it until I went looking for it. But I do have to admit that it's wild to me that almost exactly 20 years after 9-11, our government is being reorganized while all eyes are on Afghanistan. You know, they say history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. In Afghanistan, I know that is worth talking about. And it actually made a surprise appearance down this rabbit hole too. So I will talk about Afghanistan in the middle of the episode and more in the future. But basically there's a lot going on in this episode. So essentially what you're going to hear today is I read the bill known in media, if it's known at all, as the Capitol Police Bill to see what became law in the wake of January 6th. The bill that became law, I found to be very different from the version that got the most press coverage a few months ago. And this is the one that had the Afghanistan dingleberry in it. Very interesting stuff. Then I read all the bills that I could find in the last two Congresses related to defining and punishing domestic terrorism. So I basically looked for anything I could find written since the George Floyd protests, and I found some things. But the bigger story... I think here is that in that process, I also found plans, detailed ones, that are already in motion put in place by the Biden administration that are concerning enough without Congress having to change any laws because it turns out that the laws we already have on the books are psycho enough to allow it all to happen. Now, as always, I'm going to give you all my sources for everything I talk about because I know how some of this sounds like (laughs) Sometimes you just want to be like, what? I want to see that for myself. Well, I make that as easy for you as I possibly can. I'm all about primary sources. And so you can look at the bills for yourself. Most of them are short for this episode. And you can read all the articles and documents. And we're going to give you my highlighted PDFs now. But I think that's especially important in this episode because I'm going to be sharing with you my interpretation of what the documents say. Because of course, the bills use you know lawyer language. And the documents use political language because they never come right out and say these things like, you know, we're going to use flying robots to drop bombs on people's neighborhoods and we will kill innocent people. They never write that. Instead, they write like, we will use UAVs to target enemy combatants with as minimal collateral damage as is practicable. (laughs) Only in government documents do I ever see the word practicable. But they use that type of speech. And so I am rewriting their bullshit in my head. And I'm going to tell you what they appear to be doing if it were written in normie language, because my goal is to understand how their actions affect us. So I'm going to share with you the narrative that's floating around in my head from the receiving end of their rules and laws. But because this is an interpretation, I do think it's worth your time to take a look at the actual documents to see how they describe what they're doing. And I think you should do that in order to confirm my version of reality and to judge for yourself if my interpretations are fair. And if you want to have a friendly discussion about any of this, because I know so much of it is going to be subjective, but if you want to have a friendly discussion, that's what the thank you episodes for producers are for. Because those who pay for this show, which... The show is funded on the value for value system. I might as well tell you about this now because I need your help in it. (laughs) The podcast is funded on the value for value system. So what that means is that I'm going to produce a podcast episode that's valuable because it has information. And if you like me, people seem to find it entertaining. 
but I give you my product for free up front, and then you pay whatever you consider the episode and podcast to be worth in this world. And if you find an episode especially valuable and would be proud to have your name on it, you can pay $535 and have your name listed as an executive producer on that episode and have your feedback shared with the community on a main numbered episode because those episodes have the largest audiences. And that's only if you want to do that. That's definitely not required. But to become an executive producer and to essentially vouch for an episode, that $535 can be a lump sum, but it's also cumulative. So if you contribute monthly with paper checks or PayPal or Zelle or whatever, or per episode on Patreon or on Venmo or Zelle, whatever, all the payments you make are building towards executive producer credits. Because I'm happy to share credit with you if you're helping me pay to produce these episodes, even if it's back pay. Because I desperately need the help to keep doing this and to make it better. And at that funding level, you're making that possible. Like I said, even for old episodes, because I'm starting to really see it as like being back paid. And all of the episodes with no executive producers, you know, I paid for the production of those out of pocket with the big donation bucket. And so when I see that an episode gets an executive producer credit, I do get a lot of satisfaction from seeing the production costs paid off by someone else. You know, I, I feel like investment in an episode after the fact is still investment. And by making it public, you can see which episodes our investors were most proud of. There's more to the value for value business model, but let's just leave it there. Enough production room talk for now, because I do have some exciting news to share with you about the future of Congressional Dish. And I want to give you the full scoop at the end of this episode, because I'm just twitching to get started with all the things I have to tell you. But basically... You're going to hear this entire episode in every episode of Congressional Dish without commercials because we don't allow corporate influence here. That's why this show is so independent and so unique. The business model is key to it, but you are key to it too. We need you to pay for it if you can. Literally every dollar helps and, and is appreciated. So please, if you get anything out of this episode or any episode of Congressional Dish, pay what you think is fair. And thank you very much for participating. Okay, so now... Are you ready for my interpretation of what Congress and the Biden administration are doing? Are you ready to hear about how the federal government is shifting to focus on investigating Americans for pre-crime, censoring the Internet and enacting domestic sanctions, essentially waging economic war on American citizens? Y'all ready for this? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but let's have some fun exposing their plans. Okay, so first up is a bill that was written in the aftermath of January 6th that has made it all the way into law. This is a emergency supplemental law, which basically means that it passes out emergency money on top of the money that Congress has already passed out for this year. And this emergency money is in what has been branded in media land as the Capitol Police Bill. And it was the original version of this bill that made headlines when it passed the House of Representatives back in May, not only because it was worth almost $2 billion in emergency money, but also because the vote was so close. It passed the House 213 to 212 with every Republican voting no. And so the story really was about the, the Democrats, the few that were against it and all the politics of that and blah, blah, blah. I don't care. But what I do care about is what was in this bill and law. Now, I first heard about the bill version of this from a journalist who I generally like and respect, Glenn Greenwald. And so I'm going to pick on him for a bit, but he was far from the only person who reported this way about the House version that passed in May. But here's what Greenwald told his 1.5 million followers and readers that the Capitol Police would get from the House bill. He said, quote, Armed with close to $2 billion in additional spending, which the House approved in May, unquote. But the thing is that I read the House version a few weeks ago, and it is wildly inaccurate to say that $2 billion was ever intended, even in that version, to go to the Capitol Police. In that first version, the entire bill would have spent $1.9 billion in emergency funding. But the Capitol Police would have gotten about $80 million of that. The largest chunks of money would have gone to the architect of the Capitol, who would have gotten $572 million to repair the damage caused by the riot, and $722 million would have gone to the Department of Defense to reimburse them for the National Guard services. 
And even more than that, $873 million, about half the money, would have gone to the Congress and related agencies for more COVID response money. And the Capitol Police would have only gotten about a million dollars from that money bucket. So the reporting on this bill from its birth has been mind-bogglingly inaccurate. Half of the original version was for COVID sh- And the Capitol Police were never at any time even in the running for $2 billion. Didn't happen. And so what happened as this bill moved its way through Congress? Well, in the end, in the version that became law, the Capitol Police, of course, didn't get anywhere near the widely reported level of funding that people seem to think they did. In fact, the Capitol Security Bill that became law on July 30th is a stunningly different version from the first one. In the law version, the overall cost of the bill actually increased from $1.9 billion to $2.1 billion. And about half of that, over $1 billion, is going to the Defense Department. Now, half of the Defense Department money, about $500 million, so a quarter of the emergency money in the law, was put into the Defense Department's Overseas Humanitarian Disaster and Civic Aid account. Now, this account, according to the Defense Department, is for, quote, building the capacity of partner nations, civilian and military institutions to provide essential services to the civilian populations, unquote. So it's a nation building account. It's exactly the kind of account that pays for what we've been trying to do in Afghanistan for 20 years. Fund a police and military jobs program for other countries that will protect our puppet government from being overthrown. So put another way, a quarter of the money in the capital security law was an emergency war department nation building dingleberry, which clearly has nothing to do with responding to January 6th. And an even bigger pot of money than that, worth more than a quarter of the emergency money, $600 million was spent on an equally irrelevant to January 6th dingleberry for the State Department for their bilateral economic assistance account. Now, that money is split into two money buckets. So one of the buckets is $100 million for, quote, humanitarian needs in Afghanistan and to assist Afghan refugees, unquote, which tells me clearly that Congress knew that trouble was on the horizon and that Afghanistan refugee assistance would be needed. Again, this was signed into law on July 30th. The Afghanistan withdrawal date announced to the whole world is August 31st. But Kabul fell to the Taliban on August 11th. Whoopsie. But to say that nobody saw this coming was bullshit. Even Congress saw it coming. They knew we'd have to get people out of Afghanistan. And there was a dingleberry in here, a change in policy on top of that related to the Afghan special immigrant visa program. Now, here's the thing. I don't have details for that for you right now. That's a whole other rabbit hole. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read that section of the law for the next episode, which will be released the weekend of September 11th. By then, the deadline for withdrawal from Afghanistan will have passed. And so I'll have a clearer big picture by then. Right now, I'm still watching to see what happens. But I really want to know exactly what Congress authorized in this emergency funding law. I want to know which Afghanistanis were granted visas. Did they increase or decrease the number of people and money and whatever? You know, what was the number of people that we were going to welcome into our country? Because I think a lot of us feel terrible that there were people in Afghanistan who helped our soldiers and our contractors with their impossible mission of trying to turn Afghanistan into a country just like ours. But there were people in Afghanistan who trusted our promises, who trusted our words that we would take care of them if it all went to sh**, which was a very likely possibility. Even in the Biden administration's defense of the chaotic withdrawal currently underway, have you noticed that they keep saying that they didn't think the Taliban would take over the country so soon? They're not even pretending that they thought it was possible for the Afghanistani government that we created to be in charge forever without us there. And 31 days before the deadline, Congress passed some emergency visa measure for Afghan refugees into law. And I want to know the details. But let's finish this rabbit hole first. I know this Afghanistan story is important and on everybody's mind right now. So let's give it the attention it deserves, which is a full episode. 
Plus, releasing an end of the Afghanistan war episode on the 20 year anniversary of 9 11 just feels appropriate to me, too, since that attack is what got us into that 20 year grift of a war anyway. So that's coming. But for now, let's get back to the so called capital security law, which again gave $100 million plus a visa dingleberry for Afghanistan refugees. Now, the rest of the State Department money, which is the much larger money pot worth a full quarter of the emergency cash, $500 million, that's for the State Department, again, their account for the United States Emergency Refugee and Migration Assistance Fund. Now, it's worth noting that this much larger pot of money was not designated specifically for Afghanistan, because we do also have refugees fleeing other countries that we've meddled in in Central America. But with everything that's going on right now at the Kabul airport, it's probably good that the State Department does have this money standing by that's able to be used. And so that's over half of the new law, defense and State Department money for things that have exactly nothing to do with capital security or January 6th. The other half of the Defense Department emergency money, because remember, they got a full half of the money in this law. Well, the other half of the Defense Department money, $600 million, is going to go to the National Guard to reimburse them for the essentially martial law that they inflicted upon Washington, D.C. for four months after the MAGA mob got into the Capitol building, which cost the National Guard about $520 million. So there's an extra $80 million or so cherry on top in the funding for the National Guard for their troubles. It's the remaining quarter of the bill that's divided up amongst expenses that, for the most part, are actually directly connected to January 6th. So out of the $2 billion in the law, about $300 million of that is going to go to the architect of the Capitol and the Capitol Police to repair the damage that was done on January 6th. $281 million of that is going to go for stuff that's obvious, doors, windows, and other physical security measures. And $17 million is going to go to new security cameras. They also put in a new rule in here, which says that none of the funds now or in the future can be used to install permanent above ground fencing around the perimeter or any portion of the United States Capitol grounds. So anyone that was worried about permanent fencing, it is now illegal for that to be a thing in Washington, D.C. Also in that quarter of the money that's actually going to the Capitol, about $40 million of that is going to go for coronavirus-related expenses, which this was a huge change from the original version. Remember, in the original version, half of the $2 billion, so about a billion dollars was going for more COVID. Sh- that got cut down to $40 million here. And then finally, there's about $106 million for the Capitol Police. And I'll break that 106 down in a second, but I just want to reiterate here that the Capitol Police did not get $2 billion. It didn't happen. It was never even a possibility. In the end, the Capitol Police got 5% of that in actual appropriated cash. And here's what the money's for. So there's $37.5 million for salaries for the Capitol Police. And there's also $35.4 million for mutual aid and training. Now, $9 million of that is going to go to the local law enforcement partners who also responded on January 6th. As we learned in the last episode, there were different police departments that responded that day. So some of it's a reimbursement, which leaves $25 million for Capitol Police training, which they clearly, obviously need. So it's good to see at least one of the clear lessons of January 6th being responded to in legislation that's already made it into law. Capitol Police can afford the training that they never bothered to do. There's also $33 million in here for general expenses. And this is for stuff like, like $2.6 million will go for physical protection barriers and other equipment. There's going to be $5 million for reimbursable, 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 I can't say that word reimbursable. I guess that's the word. (laughs) Whatever. It's going to go for agreements with state and local law enforcement agencies. So more partnerships with like the Metropolitan Police Department, for example. And then another part of this is $4.8 million for protective details for Congress. 
And I want to pause on that one for a second because protective details for Congress is where major changes are occurring. And to be fair to Glenn Greenwald, even though he clearly didn't look at the funding levels in the bill he wrote about, it was this revelation I'm about to share with you about the expansion of the Capitol Police Department that he was exposing back in May, and I am grateful for it. Basically, the scoop is that the U.S. Capitol Police, which, as we learned in the last episode, is responsible for guarding and protecting about two square miles of Washington, D.C., which is property that they're in, they're in charge of the congressional buildings, the Supreme Court, the Library of Congress, and the parks surrounding those buildings. That's what the Capitol Police is for. But since January 6th, the U.S. Capitol Police have announced that they're going to start opening other branches, and I'm quoting from their press release right now, for, quote, enhanced security for members of Congress outside of the National Capitol region, unquote. So the Capitol Police is essentially being transformed into a personal police force for certain members of Congress, and we already know where the first two regional offices will be. One of the offices will be in California in, surprise, surprise, Nancy Pelosi's district of San Francisco. And the other office is going to be in Tampa, Florida, in Kathy Castor's district, who is a good friend of Nancy Pelosi's. Now, we know that the offices are going to physically be in the same buildings as the regional fusion centers. In this country right now, we have 80 or so fusion centers located all over the place, which are basically meeting places for government and companies to come together and share information about us with each other. And I have been suspicious of these creepy fusion centers for a long time because they're, of course, a post 9-11 thing designed to aid government spying. But what this tells me is that these Centers for the Development of Corporatism will now have officers close by who will essentially be acting as the personal police force of the elite, specifically of members of Congress. But what will that look like on a day-to-day basis? I have no way to know. The plan locations are all that I can really tell you about at this point. There is very little known at this moment about what these Capitol Police forces in California and Florida will actually do, when they're going to begin their work, and how many people will be staffing these offices. And we do know that the Capitol Police are saying that these two new offices are just the beginning, and they're going to be announcing even more locations soon. Now, when I look at this, you know, on the one hand, I can see why members of Congress would want to be protected. I mean, I'm an internet figure that deals with people that have very strong political opinions, and it's been scary from time to time. And I also can't help but think of Gabby Giffords. Gabby Giffords was a Democrat in Arizona, and she went to a safe way to meet her constituents. She had a little table outside in Tucson, Arizona, and some freak walked up with a gun and shot her in the face. Now, that was really scary. I was actually in Tucson right after it happened. But the thing is that after that happened, Congress didn't go giving themselves protective details at home after that. Even after Gabby Giffords, the common wisdom was that local police could handle protecting members of Congress in their own districts. And it's been 10 years since Gabby Giffords got shot, and it seems to be working out just fine. So when I look at the big picture, I just don't think it's necessary for members of Congress to have their own local police forces. There are plenty of local law enforcement officers who can investigate credible threats. This feels like a super self-serving overreaction to Capitol security failures. The Capitol Police are supposed to guard about two miles of Washington, D.C., and they failed that! After not doing any training at all for a situation where a group of motivated protesters would attempt to enter the Capitol building, which is a scenario you would think they would be prepared for. That lack of training still boggles my mind. But the problem was not that Nancy Pelosi didn't have her own personal police force in San Francisco. And so I guess I just don't like that this is just another way for members of Congress to separate themselves from the rest of us, to provide themselves with a layer of protection from us dirty peasants that they're supposed to represent. I don't like that this will even further distance them from the experiences of us normies. 
Like, how can they understand what it's like to worry about homelessness and crime in our neighborhoods, which I worried about daily as a resident of the San Francisco Bay Area? How can they be worried on the same level as we are if they have their own police forces escorting them around? You know, this is kind of an evil thought, but it's how I really feel. I think it's kind of a good thing that ex-Senator Barbara Boxer got her phone stolen out of her hand at Jack London Square in Oakland. The only way that that could have been better is if she was a current senator, because that has happened to so many of my friends. And I just feel like once it happens to you, you just care more. Living in the San Francisco Bay Area, I didn't carry a purse for years. I just started carrying a purse again after moving out of that San Francisco Bay hellhole because wearing a purse around there is like painting a giant sign on your back that says, please rob me. You know, Nancy Pelosi already couldn't relate to our experiences in San Francisco because A, she spends so little time there. She hasn't done a town hall where she speaks to us face to face in literally 30 years but also because she's so filthy rich that she would never have to ride BART or take a lift or, God forbid, walk to get around. I mean, walk on the streets? Can you imagine? Oh, please. No, she's a town car traveler. She lives a totally separate experience than the rest of us already. And now she gets her own police force. You know, the rich, disconnected members of Congress which right now describes most of them. Most of them are millionaires. They keep walling themselves off from the rest of us. And so no wonder they seem incapable of solving our problems. They don't know what our problems are from behind their safe guarded walls. Walls they are using January 6th as an excuse to build even taller. Now with guard towers. If you have any opinions about that, the Capitol Police are governed by the Capitol Police Board, which are the House Sergeant-at-Arms, the Senate Sergeant-at-Arms, and the Architect of the Capitol. They're the ones calling these shots. And of course, you can also call your member of Congress, too. Okay, so that's all that's become law so far in response to January 6th. And I want to be crystal clear about this. For the rest of this episode, the bills I'll be talking about, they are not laws. They are bills. But even though I've been steadily moving away from reading and reporting on bills because the final product is often so different from the various versions, I do feel like it's important to look at these to get an idea of what is being suggested in legislation by the Democrats who are currently in charge of every branch of the federal government and who we all know are freaking out about domestic terrorism in the United States. Here's an example. Here's Senator Gary Peters of Michigan. He's the chairman of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, which is the top oversight committee policing the Department of Homeland Security in the Senate. He said this on March 3rd. But the January 6th attack must mark a turning point. There can be no question that the domestic terrorist threat, including violence driven by white supremacist and anti-government groups, is the gravest terrorist threat to our homeland security. Moving forward, the FBI, which is tasked with leading our counterterrorism efforts, and the Department of Homeland Security, which ensures that state and local law enforcement understands the threats that American communities face, must address this deadly threat with the same focus and resources and analytical rigor that they apply to foreign threats such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Here's another one. This clip is from the House of Representatives. This is Representative Alyssa Slotkin, also of Michigan, and she's the chair of the House Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Intelligence and Counterterrorism. She said this on March 24th. The post 9-11 era um, of security where the threats come from abroad is over. In the 20 years of the post 9-11 era, um, they came to an end on January 6th. The new reality is that we have to that we have to come to terms with is that it's uh, our extremists here at home seeking to exploit internal divisions um, that pose the greatest threat. These are the people currently empowered to write our laws. So I wanted to see what they are doing or thinking of doing to combat what they perceive to be our gravest threat, domestic terrorism, despite the actual threat level. Here's new Democratic senator and seemingly reasonable human being, Senator John Ossoff of Georgia, speaking on July 27th. According to DHS-FBI data, from 2015 to 2019, 
65 Americans uh, were tragically killed in domestic terrorist attacks. And I want to put that in context by referring to CDC homicide data over the same period, 2015 to 2019. 94,636 Americans uh, killed by homicide over that same period. And so what's the difference between the deaths caused by domestic terrorism and deaths caused by homicide? Because both are murder crimes. Well, here's the existing legal definition of domestic terrorism, which, as it's already written in law, is problematic and way too broad. Because I have to tell you, lots of people in the Democratic Party loyalist crowd keep quoting it to me since my impeachment and Capitol riot episodes as if it proves that the MAGA rioters should be branded as terrorists. As if we haven't established time and time again that the laws written during my lifetime by the very same humans currently in Congress now are often writing our laws without input from experts, inserting them into long bills, and passing them without the vast majority of Congress having the chance to read them. And this particular definition was written on page 106 of the Patriot Act, one of the worst rights-annihilating laws ever written in this country, which was a law that was introduced to Congress on October 23, 2001, and which was law two days later. So let's be careful about pretending that this current definition should be gospel. It's a Patriot Act thing, which should be a huge flapping red flag. And so here's the definition of domestic terrorism written in this era of shocking legislative irresponsibility. Domestic terrorism is, quote, activities that involve acts dangerous to human life that are a violation of the criminal laws of the United States or of any state, which appear to be intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population, to influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion, or to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping, and occur primarily within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States, unquote. All that stuff in there, in that definition about intention, that was all added by the Patriot Act. And the intention part, the intention to influence government, that is the part that has had many of us who pay close attention concerned for 20 years that this law could eventually be used to criminalize protest and dissent within the United States. That wasn't a part of the definition of domestic terrorism before 9-11. And it's that part that is being quoted by people right now trying to spin the January 6th riot into a 9-11 type event. It's also interesting that people are glossing over the, quote, mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping, unquote, part of that definition, none of which actually happened on January 6th. And no, breaking windows and entering a building doesn't count as mass destruction any more than breaking and entering into a target would. But this is the slippery slope that we are sliding down, and it is very disturbing to me that I am witnessing members of my own audience greasing that slide. Listen to the last thank you episode for some examples. Basically, I'm watching my fears about the Patriot Act coming true, and none of the bills that I read attempt to rein in that overly broad definition of domestic terrorism in any way. What they do is they either expand the definition or expand enforcement based upon it. And that alone is cause for concern. And before I get into the details of these bills, I should say that I also know that this episode may be premature. In fact, I'm positive that it is. Because I think by now, after nine years of congressional dish, we have learned that most legislative scandals become law attached to large bills, often must sign funding bills, and often at the end of the year during the holidays. But I want to know what to be on the lookout for, considering that last year's funding law was over 5,000 pages. And so here's what I found. So the scariest bill was written by the bug-eyed pathological liar who was the lead man in the Russiagate impeachment fiasco, Representative Adam Schiff of California. And in case you can't tell from my tone, I consider Adam Schiff to be one of the scariest humans in this Congress. Although... He looks so much like a stereotypical Martian that I am not 100% certain that he's human. I have not done the DNA test. But regardless, E.T., the Russia Gators bill, was written even before January 6th. It was written during the last Congress in the wake of the George Floyd protests, and it's called the Confronting the Threat of Domestic Terrorism Act. 
This bill would apply laws and strict penalties currently applied only to foreign people who kill or injure Americans. It would apply those stricter penalties to everyone, including Americans. And it expands the offenses that qualify as domestic terrorism to include attempted assaults and property damage intended to influence our government. So you wouldn't have to actually harm a single person to be considered a terrorist if Adam Schiff has his way. Throw something at a protest, attempted assault, you're a terrorist. This bill is a giant leap towards authoritarianism. Now, the good news about this bill is that it's currently dead. It died in the last Congress and Adam Schiff has not reintroduced it in the 117th Congress yet. But the bad news is that Adam Schiff is A, still in Congress, B, is on the January 6th Commission, and C, is still the chairman of the powerful House Intelligence Committee. This paranoid freak is supposed to be policing the intelligence community, which goes far to explain their current cushy state of lawlessness. The scary fact is that Adam Schiff is very powerful in this current House of Representatives. He's at the center of the Democratic Party's decision-making in terms of the January 6th response, and he is a trusted member of Nancy Pelosi's leadership team. But Schiff's confronting the threat of Domestic Terrorism Act is sleeping in a casket for now. So we just need to watch out for the zombie in bills and in amendments to bills that have Adam Schiff's name on them going forward. In this current Congress, though, there are some domestic terrorism related bills that are alive. One of them is H.R. 350, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act of 2021. This was introduced in the House on January 19th, right after January 6th, by Brad Schneider of Illinois. Here's the crazy part. It has 204 co-sponsors. 201 of them are Democrats, three are Republicans, which means that it is supported by almost the entire Democratic Party in the House of Representatives, so much so that they're willing to put their names on it, not just vote for it. Over in the Senate, there is a nearly identical bill with the same name. It's S-964, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act. This was introduced two months later at the end of March by Senator Dick Durbin, also of Illinois. Now, like I said, the two bills are almost identical. The Senate bill has a provision limiting personally identifiable information in reports that isn't in the House version. That's the only difference. But basically, both versions would create a new domestic terrorism unit at the Department of Homeland Security, a domestic terrorism office at the Department of Justice, and a domestic terrorism section at the FBI. And all of the new branches of the federal government would be authorized for 10 years. These offices would be required to provide training to state and local law enforcement to help them understand, detect, and deter, prevent domestic terrorism using the domestic terrorism definition that was written in the Patriot Act. There would also be an interagency task force created with the FBI director, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Attorney General, and the Defense Secretary to weed out white supremacists and neo-Nazis in law enforcement and the military. But the craziest part is it provides authorization for unlimited funding for these new branches of federal law enforcement and prosecution. Unlimited funding for three brand new offices in federal law enforcement charged solely with hunting down Americans suspected of planning to influence or coerce our own government. All they have to do is cook up any reason to suspect that we may use violence and we are fair game for targeting. Again, the problem I have with all of this is that they are trying to prevent terrorism. In this case, prevent crimes intended to influence government. That's the difference between crime and terrorist crime, intention to influence government. And if these become law, you don't have to actually do anything to get caught up in this law enforcement web. Any indication that you're trying to influence government and anything said or seen that could imply that you're thinking of physically doing something about it. So if you buy a plane ticket to D.C. for a protest, for example, or if you're photographed ever holding a gun, They just need something they can hold up and say, this person may be violent in the future and their investigations and preventative actions may begin. And we have identical bills in the House and the Senate, one of them co-sponsored by pretty much the entire damn Democratic Party in the House that would create not one, not two, but three new federal agencies dedicated to those efforts. No thank you. 
Now, the good news at this moment is that neither of these bills have moved yet in the House or the Senate. But again, considering that almost the entire Democratic Party in the House is co-sponsoring this thing, it has a chance. And so I'm tracking both of these bills and I will let you know if they show any signs of life or if they look like they're going to get the dingleberry treatment. Along the same lines, because it's damn near the same bill that we need to keep an eye on, is S-963, the Domestic Terrorism and Hate Crimes Prevention Act. This one has been reported out of committee. It was reported on March 25th, which means that unlike the other two, this one has moved. And it does the exact, almost the exact same things as the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act of 2021, creating new domestic terrorism units at the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, and the FBI, and authorizing unlimited funding. But this one, the main difference is that it also requires the attorney general to conduct a review of, quote, COVID-19 hate crimes, unquote, which is defined as violent crimes motivated by the, quote, actual or perceived race, ethnicity, age, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, or disability of any person and the actual or perceived relationship to the spread of COVID-19 of any person because of, unquote, those characteristics. And some of those just don't make any sense in relation to COVID-related attacks. I mean, like race, I understand because people have been violent towards Asians because of, I mean, you all remember the Wuhan flu, Kung flu, ha ha ha, China did this. And so there are people getting attacked because they are being blamed for COVID-19. According to another bill that became law recently, increasing hate crime reporting requirements, there were almost 3,800 reports of anti-Asian violence related to COVID-19 between March 19, 2020 and the end of February this year, taking place in all 50 states. So that concern is real. But gender? What are gender-based COVID-19 hate crimes? Age? No one is beating up the olds for dying of COVID more often, or even the youngs for not getting vaccinated more often. It's just not a thing. And sexual orientation? COVID is not AIDS, and no one is acting like it is. COVID violence in the real world, though? Like, I've seen anti-maskers getting crazy on planes. I've seen school board members getting harassed for trying to do the impossible job of finding an acceptable middle ground between parents who want their kids sent to school in spacesuits and parents who think that adding a sneeze guard to the dress code is the second coming of Hitler. And while I haven't seen it yet, I could also envision violence against anti-vaxxers. You know, pandemic of the unvaccinated, who hasn't heard that phrase lately? But COVID hate crimes against gays, trans, I mean, this identity politics stuff, is there any place the Democrats don't think it belongs? It's so annoying. But in the grand scheme of things in this bill, that part is relatively harmless. That's a study. It's the other provisions, the ones ripped from the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act that provide unlimited funding for three new branches of the federal government aimed at stopping us from influencing our government. That's the part that matters. And this bill is ready for a vote in the Senate Anytime Chuck Schumer is ready. So those are the domestic terrorism bills. None of them have become law yet. But what I find kind of fascinating about all the bills that are alive in this Congress is that they all aim to authorize new branches of the federal government to focus on investigating Americans suspected of wanting to influence their own government. And even though none of those bills have moved through even half of Congress, the Department of Homeland Security under the Biden administration is moving forward with creating new branches of government anyway. So first up, on May 11th, the Department of Homeland Security announced that it's going to be creating a new Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships. CP3 is its acronym. But this office is going to replace the Office for Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention, which itself was replacing a war on terror era program called Countering Violent Extremism, which broadly investigated Muslim Americans as terrorism risks for doing things like attending a mosque more frequently or expressing concern about anti-Muslim discrimination or human rights abuses. And so a program with a known history of racial bias and profiling will be transformed again, morphing into a new office, aiming their efforts at all 
all Americans. The purpose of this office will be to do, quote, behavioral threat assessments, unquote, on Americans and identify early risk factors that they think might lead to radicalization and violence. Again, the first version of this office, when it was a program, considered attending religious ceremonies and speaking out about injustices as suspicious. So suspicious, quote, early risk factors, unquote, that is super subjective, too. And so how exactly are they planning to define what suspicious early risk factors are? Well, according to the Department of Homeland Security press release, quote, individuals who may be radicalizing or have radicalized to violence typically exhibit behaviors that are recognizable to many but are best understood by those closest to them, such as friends, family, and classmates, unquote. So translation, they intend to have a snitch on the weirdos in our lives and have the local community law enforcers intervene. And this was confirmed, using political language, of course, on July 27th by Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, who is testifying to the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. What we seek to do is more effectively disseminate what we learn about those trends, mindful of rights of privacy and civil rights and civil liberties, disseminate that information to our state, local, tribal, territorial partners on the one hand, and importantly, to equip local communities to empower them to address the threat uh, in uh, their own neighborhoods. So the plan is to have the Department of Homeland Security collect information about us, pass it out to various places in our home communities, and send mental health and social services out to the weirdos in cooperation with police. Now, on its face, this might seem like a good idea. I know it's been kicked around a lot when we have these mass shootings and stuff. And I think we all know at least one person or two who we think could use some monitoring. I recently said the phrase, I think it's just a matter of time before she picks up a knife and stabs her mom. And I totally meant it. So we all have weirdos in our life. But this idea starts to look a lot worse upon more careful examination. When the Department of Homeland Security press release about this rebranded office was released, the Brennan Center for Justice came out forcefully against it, basically because trying to predict the acts of individuals is impossible and civil rights tend to get trampled on when law enforcement tries. And the Biden administration knows this. The very studies that it cites in its plan say that predicting who will engage or attempt to engage in terrorism is a, quote, unrealistic goal, unquote. Instead, what they claim they are going to do is identify actions and statements or anything else that those who have carried out violent attacks in the past have in common. They're going to label those common characteristics as risk factors and then use those as sort of a checklist of suspicions for predicting our future crimes. And there's a lot of problems with this strategy, not least of which being that we're supposed to be protected by the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution against unlawful searches. And being targeted for future crimes seems to violate that amendment to me. But setting our pesky rights aside, as the elites so often choose to do, this is problematic from a practical side, too. Because the signs that many violent attackers have had in common are often mental health issues, like having trouble at home or in relationships or having a political or personal grievance. You know, millions of us have combinations of those types of issues. I certainly do. And so because these types of issues are so common, they can't reliably be used to weed out potentially violent Americans from ordinary, depressed, politically unhappy Americans. And so if we allow this, any of us that have expressed dissatisfaction with our government could become suspects for future crime and investigated by DHS and the FBI with no warrants, using Patriot Act terrorism laws to make it legal-ish. Also, as pointed out by the Brennan Center for Justice, the plans for this Department of Homeland Security Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships doesn't account for how race, religion, and ethnicity will influence who is tagged as dangerous. You know, millions of us took to the street last summer to protest the unfair treatment of our darker-skinned friends by law enforcement in this country. And in counterterrorism, we all know that Muslims have been suspected of being terrorists just for believing the Quran's version of religious fairy tales. 
And as I mentioned before, this very same office, when it was merely a program, has already been caught blurring the distinction between Muslim American beliefs and their behaviors. And in case you are counting on white privilege to keep you immune, remember who the January 6th rioters were. Here's Daniel Glazer, the former assistant secretary for terrorist financing and financial crimes at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. He was called to testify to Congress about domestic terrorist financing on February 25th, and this is what he said. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to talk about how the U.S. government can employ similar tools and strategies against white nationalists and other domestic terrorist groups as it has employed against global jihadist groups over the past two decades. White people, we're targets now. You know, this reminds me of that old poem from World War II. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Well, first they came for the Muslims, then the immigrants. Then the MAGA idiots. You know, history doesn't repeat, but it sure does rhyme. <sighs> but back to the new Department of Homeland Security office. The strategy of having Americans snitch on each other and then sending law enforcement escorted counselors to intervene in the personal lives of weirdos. Even if you think getting weirdos mental health care is a good idea, linking access to mental health care services to a propensity for violent crime also makes it less likely that people will seek out help when they think they need it. Because no one who is not a criminal wants to be treated like a criminal or seen in their community as a possible criminal. And also just practically, how is this going to work in a country that doesn't have enough mental health care available for those of us who are seeking it out voluntarily? We don't have the health care infrastructure for this. We don't really do preventative health care in this privatized health care system. And so you know who's going to show up at the doors of the weirdos. It's law enforcement. So do you really want to live in a country where if you express a combination of political frustration and depression online, the cops will come knocking on your door suspecting you of future crime? Because the office in charge of facilitating that is being created right now in the Department of Homeland Security. And that facilitation is coming with funding. Because the Department of Homeland Security, since January 6th, has designated domestic violent extremism as a national priority area on their priorities list for the first time. And the real world repercussions of that is that state, local, tribal, and territorial governments are now required to spend at least 7.5% or a minimum of $77 million of their Department of Homeland Security grants towards punishing and preventing future crimes committed in attempt to influence our government, which they are calling terrorism. And so that's one new, although technically rebranded, office of government. So maybe it's not really new, but it's kind of new. Its, it's mission is new. But the Biden administration's Department of Homeland Security is also legit expanding by creating a new, actually new, dedicated domestic terrorism branch within the department's Office of Intelligence and Analysis. We're getting a shiny new spook branch to gather information about Americans who exhibit an intention to influence their government. Department of Homeland Security has said that this new branch will work with the creepy fusion centers, local law enforcement, and private companies. Now, in the hearing on July 27th, Senator John Ossoff of Georgia, who's the same senator who pointed out that there have been 65 domestic terrorism murders compared to 95,000 straight up murders in the same period here in the United States. Well, here was his question to Defense Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas on July 27th. What leads you to the conclusion that the level of threat from domestic violent extremists and the level of threat posed by potential domestic terrorists has risen to the extent that it justifies this bureaucratic focus and this budgetary focus. You've requested, for example, resources to establish a new dedicated domestic terrorism branch within DHS Office of Intelligence and Analysis. And here's our new Secretary of Homeland Security's response. What we see is an increasing amount of social media traffic uh, that is um, based on ideologies of hate, 
uh, and extremism, false narratives, and an increasing connectivity to violence, intention to commit violent acts. And so that is what causes us to um, conclude that this is the greatest terrorist-related threat that we face um, in our homeland today. They think this because of social media posts. I'm telling you, all signs are pointing towards online speech being used as a justification for treating Americans as suspects of future crime. And there's this. Here's Alejandro Mayorkas, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Domestic terrorism is the most lethal and persistent terrorism-related threat to the United States today. That is why we are requesting $131 million to support innovative methods to prevent domestic terrorism while respecting privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. And what exactly they told Congress they want to do with that money, the specifics, I can't share with you because the Department of Homeland Security budget request hearing was closed to the public, which is not normal. Intelligence-related budget request hearings are often closed to the public, but the whole Department of Homeland Security, no, because I've watched them before. But this is what's being said in public hearings to Department of Homeland Security officials by powerful members of the Democratic Party in Congress right now, so we can kind of guess how things went for DHS in that behind-closed-doors meeting. Here's Representative Alyssa Slotkin of Michigan. Again, this is the chair of the House Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Intelligence and Counterterrorism. We know we have an uphill battle. Um, our subcommittee runs, r- stands ready to help the department with what you need. If you need changes to legislation, if you need resources, we want to hear more from you, not less. So the money is coming. Those empowered in this Congress are making it crystal clear that they are willing and obviously able to provide it. These new offices within the Department of Homeland Security are pieces of an overall strategy by the Biden administration, a strategy which they have laid out in surprising detail. So, on Joe Biden's first day in office as president, he requested an assessment of domestic terrorist threats, which was submitted by his National Security Council on March 17th. Out of that assessment came the Biden administration's National Strategy for Countering Domestic Terrorism, which is a 32-page document which I have highlighted and put in the show notes for you. But I'll summarize the plan for you right now. First up, Let's look at who is labeled as domestic terrorists by the Biden administration. There are self-proclaimed militias. There's also small groups of informally aligned individuals and lone actors. Taken together, that's pretty much everybody. And the intelligence assessment ordered by Biden on day one said that it's the last two, the comically broad categories of small groups and lone actors. Those are the categories that they say pose the greatest threat. And so in those categories, the Biden plan then breaks it down into more specific groups of suspected future terrorists. So the first group is made up of people exhibiting racial, ethnic, or religious hatred that leads to violence, especially the people that think white is right. The second group is made up of people exhibiting anti-government or anti-authority beliefs, and they call this a, quote, significant component of today's threat, unquote. And in this group, the significant component, that includes militias, anarchists, People who think they're immune from government authority and laws. So I'm thinking like Clive and Bundy and his band of illegal cow grazers. They also list anyone who participates or, quote, incites imminent violence, unquote. And remember, the Democrats just impeached Donald Trump for giving a speech, which they specifically called incitement. And so people that are suspected terrorists are people who incite violence, quote, in opposition to legislative, regulatory, or other actions taken by the government, unquote. So there's that intention again, intention to influence our government. The Biden administration is also suspicious of those who, quote, oppose all forms of capitalism, corporate globalism, and governing institutions, which they perceive as harmful to society, unquote. Um, hi, I, I think I might fit into, into that box. They're also suspicious of those who are motivated by, quote, single issue ideologies, unquote. And they specifically listed abortion, animal rights and environmental rights. Um, I, I was arrested in a nonviolent protest in front of the White House to stop the Keystone XL pipeline. And everybody knows it. 
So um, that one also seems aimed directly at me. The Biden administration is also specifically suspicious of, quote, involuntary celibate violent extremism, unquote, which means that they are suspicious of sad loners who can't get laid. And to be fair, a lot of shooters seem to fit into that category, but there's also a lot of loners who can't get laid who are very, very kind people. And on top of all of those, they also have a catch-all category of suspicion. It's a category for people who, quote, may develop their own idiosyncratic justifications for violence that defy ready categorization, unquote. So they created an other category for defining domestic terrorists. And so with these categories, as broad as they are, pretty much anyone who posts any opinions online can fit the definition of a suspect. And so now that we know that the Biden administration sees us all as potential lone wolf domestic terrorists, what are the Biden administration's goals? Well, big picture, there's two of them. One, They aim to stop acts of domestic terrorism, which means investigating and stopping pre-crime. And two, they want to, quote, reduce the factors contributing to incitement to domestic terrorism online that exacerbate the spread of calls to violence, unquote. So they want to limit the spread of online speech, which they are suspicious of. To accomplish these goals, they then broke down their action plan into four pillars, So the first pillar is they want to understand and share information. Specifically, the Department of Homeland Security is going to introduce a, quote, new systematic approach for utilizing pertinent external non-governmental analysis, unquote, which translated into normal speak means that the Department of Homeland Security, which we already know is creating a brand new branch and a new office specifically for these goals, Well, the Department of Homeland Security is going to form a snitch community that extends beyond the government to foreign governments, civil society, the technology companies, universities, and other private groups. It also says that the input from these non-governmental entities were, quote, critical to the formulation of this strategy itself, unquote. And so we are watching our government being merged with the private sector here via the Department of Homeland Security, which I should also probably remind you is itself a post 9-11 invention of the George W. Bush administration and deserves all of our suspicions. But the Department of Homeland Security is not the only agency involved in this. The Department of the Treasury is also working on ways to monitor our financial activity and work closer with our banks using existing provisions in the Bank Secrecy Act. Why? Well, here's Democrat Jim Himes of Connecticut, the chairman of the Committee on Financial Services Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy. Here he is speaking in a hearing on February 25th. In the wake of the attacks of September 11th, we recast the entire federal government and worked feverishly to to defund terrorist streams. To effectively disrupt domestic extremist groups, we need to better understand their financing. To what end? Well, here's Daniel Glazer, who was a high-ranking official in the Treasury Department in both the W. Bush and Obama administrations, testifying in that same hearing. The potential measures in Treasury's toolbox include the issuance of guidance to financial institutions on financial typologies, methodologies, and red flags, uh, the establishment of public-private partnerships, the use of information sharing authorities, and the use of geographic targeting orders. Taken together, these measures will strengthen the ability of financial institutions to identify, report, and impede the financial activity of domestic extremist groups, and will ensure that the U.S. financial system is a hostile environment for these groups. So the Treasury Department already has partnerships with the banks, and the goal is to cut off problematic Americans from funding, just like they have been doing to problematic people and countries overseas. Put another way, these are sanctions. The difference now is that the sanctions, they're trying to bring them home. And so how exactly are they going to legally pull this off? Well, here's Iman Bukadum. She is the, and I keep saying that name wrong, I'm pretty sure, but she is the senior manager of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and she was also a witness in that same hearing on February 25th. What we submit is that the material support for terrorism statute, as we know, there are two of them. There is one with an international nexus that is required, and there is one that allows for investigating material support for terrorism, domestic terrorism in particular, as defined in the Patriot Act, 
with underlying statutes that allows for any crimes that take place within the United States that have no international nexus. nexus. And we believe that that second piece of the material support for terrorism statute has been neglected and can be nicely used with the domestic terrorism definition as laid out in the Patriot Act. And we hope that um, that statutory framework will be used to actually go after uh, violent white nationalists and others. The f***ing Patriot Act. Now, specifically, there are two sections of the Patriot Act that Congress is being told that they can use to turn terrorism laws inwards towards American citizens here at home. One of them is Section 314 of the Patriot Act. Section 314 facilitates information sharing between law enforcement and the banks about people and groups suspected of engaging in terrorist acts. And we've already discussed how broadly that is defined by the Patriot Act. Specifically, this gives federal, state, local, and European Union law enforcement agencies the ability to request information from 14,000 financial companies to request account and transaction information about people who are suspected of being involved in some sort of terrorism. Now, the way that this works in practice is that FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is a part of the Treasury Department, FinCEN receives requests from the law enforcement agencies, reviews those requests, and then sends notifications to the banks across the country once every two weeks, informing them that a secure internet website has been updated with more people and groups that they need to be on the lookout for. Notice I didn't say anything about warrants in that process. All that FinCEN requires from law enforcement agencies is for them to submit a form certifying that the investigation is based on credible evidence. Proving that it's credible evidence is not required. The law enforcement information requests listed by the Treasury Department for the bankers contain subject and business names, addresses, and as much personally identifying data as possible to help the banks in searching their records. The banks then must check their records for data matches, and then they have two weeks from the posting date of the request on that secret website to respond with any matches that they find in their system. Now, they say that these searches for law enforcement are for lead information only. If the law enforcement agencies want to take possession of specific documents, that's when they need some kind of order from the courts. But the phishing expedition, the creation of the transaction web, that happens before there's any kind of warrant involved. Thank you, Patriot Act. It's the same type of bullshit like when they told us that they were just collecting all our metadata from our computers and our phones. They needed a warrant to listen to the conversations, but the Patriot Act, they said, allowed them to collect all the data connecting us to each other. How long our calls are, who we called, all our digital data, you know, IP address to IP address. This is the same type of weaseling around our Fourth Amendment rights. This is how the government collects our financial metadata. And the Biden administration is telling us in plain English that they intend to expand that effort. Section 314 of the Patriot Act also, in addition to sending information between government and financial companies, also allows the companies to share our information with each other, again, with no courts examining the process. And I've been saying banks and bankers to describe the private sector side of this, but it's way bigger than that. Companies eligible for this data sharing immunity include banks, casinos, money service businesses, brokers, security dealers, mutual funds, insurance companies, precious metals and stones dealers, so jewelry stores, credit card companies, and associations that have these businesses in them. But when it comes to these companies, all those different kinds of companies, sharing information that they have about us, the regulations say that the companies don't have to have any specific information outlining the suspicions that are leading to all this information sharing, or even any declaration that they have any suspicions at all. The Patriot Act authors wanted the companies to voluntarily share information so badly so that the government could get information about peasants' financial transactions with no warrants that the Patriot Act actually gave the companies immunity for sharing this stuff. The only thing that Section 314 doesn't allow the companies to share with the government or each other is the existence of a government suspicious activity report. So they can share whatever they want to help with a warrantless investigation except for the knowledge of that investigation's existence. 
And so knowing that, here's the conversation happening in this Congress about the authorities granted in that section of the Patriot Act. Here's Representative French Hill of Arizona speaking to witness David Gernstein Ross, who is the founder and CEO of Valens Global, a think tank that advocates taking, quote, full advantage of big data and other methods enabled by new technological developments, unquote, to hunt down domestic terrorists. On 314 in the Patriot Act, uh, is that a place where we could in a protected, appropriate way, make a change that relates to this domestic issue? Or is that, in your view, uh, too challenging? No, I think it's a place where you could um, definitely uh, make a change. The 314A process allows an investigator to canvas financial institutions for potential lead information that might uh, otherwise never be uncovered. It's designed to allow disparate pieces of information to be identified, centralized, and evaluated. So when law enforcement submits a request to FinCEN to get information from financial institutions, it has to submit a written certification that each individual or entity about which the information is sought is engaged in or reasonably suspected of engaging in terrorist activity or money laundering. Um, I think that in some cases, 314A uh, may already be usable, but I think it's, it's worth looking at the 314A process to see if in this particular context, when you're looking at domestic violent extremism, as opposed to foreign terrorist organizations, there are some tweaks that would provide um, ability to get leads in this manner. The other section of the Patriot Act that is being openly discussed for tweaking in order to aim it at American citizens is Section 311 of the Patriot Act. Section 311 gave power to the Secretary of the Treasury to declare a foreign jurisdiction, so like a whole country, a foreign bank, a type of international financial transaction, or a type of account to be, quote, of primary money laundering concern, unquote. Now, to make this designation, no court involvement is required, and only the Treasury Department knows the quality of the evidence being used in these declarations. The public and the infected companies have no way to examine their evidence. It's not public, and it's often classified. So after a declaration is made by the Treasury Secretary using their secret evidence, the Treasury Secretary is then able to require the banks and other financial companies to take what they call, quote, special measures, unquote, against the suspect jurisdiction, bank transaction, or account. Now, these special measures the Treasury Secretary can require include keeping records of and reporting financial transactions, collecting and reporting ownership information, collecting and reporting on accounts that correspond with the suspect's account. So you might not be a terrorist, but like somewhere in the web, you have a financial transaction that got near one and all of a sudden you're in the suspect pool. And then this is the biggie. They can also condition or prohibit altogether the bank from opening or maintaining accounts for a suspect foreign financial institution. It's essentially an avenue for sanctions, cutting off foreign banks and accounts from the rest of the financial system. Section 311 basically gives Treasury the power to drive unilaterally and secretly a foreign bank out of business. And let's just take a beat to focus on how broad this power is. Section 311 of the Patriot Act allows sanctions on types of accounts as well as classes of transactions outside the United States. In reality, the scope of the Treasury Department's authority is functionally unlimited. The Treasury Secretary could say, for example, that wire transfers to a whole country are a primary money laundering concern and effectively ban them from taking place. That's how vast the Treasury Department's power is thanks to 311 of the Patriot Act in relation to foreign targets. But what are the Treasury Department's Patriot Act Section 311 authorities here in the United States? Well, here's Daniel Glazer again, who, like I said, was a high-ranking official in the Treasury Department in both the W. Bush and Obama and Biden administrations. And he's testifying here to the House on February 25th. Uh, Mr. Glazer, you, you, though, suggested something new that I'd like to give you maybe 30 se the 42 seconds I have left to elaborate on. You said you were, ta you were hopeful for sanctions-like authorities against domestic actors. You did nod to constitutional and civil liberties concerns, but give us another 30 seconds on exactly what you mean and perhaps most importantly, what sort of uh, you know, Fourth Amendment overlay should accompany uh, such authority? Um, well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, the, the fact is, is the Treasury Department really does not have 
um, a lot of authority to go after purely domestic groups in the way that it goes after global terrorist organizations. It simply doesn't have that authority. Um, you could imagine um, an authority that does allow for the designation of domestic organizations. It would have to take into account constitutional restrictions um, when you look, when you read uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of the court decisions, um, there's there's concerns relating uh, relating to notice. Those concerns could be addressed in a statute. There's concerns that a, a lot of the scrutiny is heightened because sanctions are usually accompanied with asset freezes. But you could imagine sanctions that um, don't involve asset freezes, that involve transaction um, uh, transaction bans, that involve. Um, uh, regulatory type of requirements that you see in Section 311 of the Patriot Act. So there's a variety of ways um, that both the due process um, uh, uh, standards could be raised from what we uh, from what we see in the global context. So they seem to be pretty confident in the government's ability to use Section 314 of the Patriot Act against Americans, the one authorizing warrantless information swaps with banks. But they're not as confident in their ability to use Section 311 to shut down financial accounts. But lawmakers are discussing what it would take to use Section 311 against Americans. They want to do it. And that is what has me concerned. I mean, think about it. I've created an entire career in this podcast of dissenting to what I consider to be problems in my government. I've protested online and in person many times. I have flown to Washington, D.C. multiple times to participate in various protests. I got arrested in front of the White House. I'm also using my right to free speech online to share what I find out about the highest, most powerful levels of our government. Now, I'm doing everything I can with the show notes to prove that I'm not a fake news peddler, but look at how broad these authorities are. Look at how few safeguards are in place. Like, I know I'm not doing anything wrong in like the grand scheme of things with Congressional Dish, but right and wrong is a determination left up to law enforcement. So what happens when there's an administration that considers exposing their corruption to be wrong? I feel personally threatened by what I'm hearing in Congress lately. You know how I make my living, crowdfunding. Yes, selling some merchandise, but mainly crowdfunding a podcast that I intend to influence a civilian population and government. So testimony like this makes the hair on my neck stand on end. Here's Daniel Rogers, the co-founder and chief technical officer at Global Disinformation Index. He's testifying to Congress in that same hearing on February 25th. These groups leverage the internet as a primary means of disseminating their toxic ideologies and soliciting funds. One only needs to search Amazon or Etsy for the term QAnon to uncover shirts, hats, mugs, books, and other paraphernalia that both monetize and further popularize the domestic violent extremist threat. Images from that fateful day last month are rife with sweatshirts that say Camp Auschwitz that until recently were for sale on websites like Teespring and Cafe Press. As we speak, at least 24 individuals indicted for their role in the January 6th insurrection, including eight members of the Proud Boys, have used crowdfunding site Give, Send, Go to raise nearly a quarter million dollars in donations. And it's not just about the money. This merchandise acts as a sort of team jersey that helps these groups recruit new members and foment further hatred towards their targets. We analyze the digital footprints of 73 groups across 60 websites and 225 social media accounts and their use of 54 different online fundraising mechanisms, including 47 payment platforms and five different cryptocurrencies, ultimately finding 191 instances of hate groups using online fundraising services to support their activities. The funding mechanisms including, included both primary platforms like Amazon, intermediate plat- intermediary platforms such as Stripe or Shopify, crowdfunding sites like GoFundMe, payments facilitators like PayPal, monetized content streaming services such as YouTube Super Chats, and cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. All of these payment mechanisms were linked to websites or social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Telegram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Gab, BitChute, and others. The sheer number of companies I just mentioned is the first clue to the scale and the scope of the problem. They see our business model as a problem. And powerful members of Congress are applauding the payment processors, the exact ones we use to fund Congressional Dish, who are essentially enacting domestic sanctions on behalf of the government. Here's Representative Alyssa Slotkin of Michigan on July 22nd. 
Some of the online platforms and online tech allow easy access for thousands, if not millions, of users to donate money through online campaigns. For example, crowdfunding through PayPal, GoFundMe, and Amazon have become popular ways in recent years for extremist groups to raise money. To put this in context, according to the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, from about 2005 to 2015, just about every extremist group they tracked featured a PayPal button on their website. Now, even though PayPal and other payment processing platforms became aware of the issue, began to ban extremists from their flat platforms, which is a great first step, these groups have persevered and maintained a strong online presence. Now, it would be illegal for the government to cut off people's accounts like that with no court order. Not even the Patriot Act currently allows government to kill off our financial accounts. And so the corporations are stepping in to do the unconstitutional things because they're private after all. They can do what they want. And PayPal, four days after that hearing on July 26th, well, the Anti-Defamation League announced a partnership with PayPal. The Anti-Defamation League is an organization founded in 1913 to fight anti-Semitism, to, to, so to fight anti-Jewish people-ism. And they have fought against groups like the Ku Klux Klan, the American Nazi Party, and they fought on the side of the good guys in the civil rights movement. They have also, however, been co-opted by assholes in the past. They shared files with the FBI and the House Committee on Un-American Activities, which was the House version of Joseph McCarthy's shameful communist witch-hunting committee. They also have a history of spying and reporting on people who are critical of Israel. Well, that organization and PayPal have partnered up for a research effort, which will gather information and share it, quote, broadly across the financial industry and with policymakers and law enforcement, unquote. PayPal also confirmed that they are working with, quote, other nonprofits and law enforcement, unquote, but they didn't name which ones. So our payment middleman for a significant amount of our podcasting funds PayPal, which owns not only PayPal, but Venmo, they are proudly partnering with groups that police political speech to turn over information to law enforcement. And it's not just PayPal. The biggest of the payment processing middlemen are problematic too. So for example, in December 2020, both Visa and MasterCard cut off Pornhub's parent company from their payment systems after an op-ed was published in the New York Times saying that videos showing child abuse and possible rape were on Pornhub, which is a site that let just about anyone post their own content. Instead of working with Pornhub's parent company to get them to put in some content moderation policies and remove the videos with illegal content, which they did almost immediately, the credit card companies instead chose to cut off the company completely from being able to process payments, effectively enacting domestic sanctions on that company, which the government couldn't legally do. The result of this is that Visa and MasterCard, as a consequence of their size, because 40% of all Americans have a MasterCard and half of us have a Visa, these huge companies are dictating rules that all websites who want to process payments have to follow. But the thing is that no one elected them to make societal rules. This is corporate power, corporate monopoly power, being wielded to police speech and enact domestic sanctions. And again, if this were done by government, it would be unconstitutional. And now the parent company of Pornhub can only process payments with cryptocurrencies, which is another thing that funds this podcast that our current lawmakers want to crack down on. Here's Chairman Alyssa Slotkin of Michigan again. But just as nefarious groups have changed their fundraising tactics after crackdowns by payment processors like PayPal, when law enforcement begins following and cracking down on illicit Bitcoin use, terrorist fundraisers advise supporters to use other cryptocurrencies to avoid detection. This was the case of a pro-ISIS website that requested its supporters send money via Monero, another cryptocurrency, instead of Bitcoin because of its privacy and safety features. Ooh, privacy features. These people are so bugged out about decentralized currencies. For another example, here's Representative Tom Malinowski of New Jersey, a man who we know for a fact has no problem funneling money to himself using the stock market while serving the public. But when it comes to cryptocurrencies... I hear the phrase that it enables the democratization of currency. And every time someone says we're democratizing something, it kind of ends the conversation. That's sort of good. I don't really understand what that means in, in this context. I think it's an abstraction, whereas ransomware attacks are not an abstraction. They're hurting people every single 
today. Um, so I'm not sure if I see it, and I think, I think we, we do need to expand this conversation to ask that fundamental question, whether the challenges that you are facing, that we are asking you to deal with um, in protecting us against all of these social ills, are challenges that are necessary, inescapable, and inevitable. And I think we have to ask, what is the good? What is the positive social value of this phenomenon that is also creating all of this harm? And, you know, I think when you look at the history of how we built modern economies in the United States and around the world, we started three or 400 years ago with multiple currencies that were unregulated and not controlled by governments. And in every modern economy, we built what we have today when government decided, no, we're going to have one currency that is issued and regulated by government. And I think I could ask you, we don't have time, how we can better regulate cryptocurrency, but I think if we regulated it, it wouldn't be crypto anymore. And so what would be the point? So I come back to the question, should this be allowed? Thank you. I yield back. So basically, we're looking at corporate-directed domestic sanctions and a crackdown on cryptocurrencies. That's where it seems like we're headed if we keep these lawmakers in charge. But back to Biden's plan, when it comes to their plan to use Patriot Act authorities to facilitate even more law enforcement and private sector information sharing, the plan did give lip service to civil liberties protections over and over again. But unlike so many other parts of their plan, they gave exactly no specifics of how our rights will be protected. Which, to be fair, how could they? The Patriot Act destroyed our Fourth Amendment rights 20 years ago, so they're just using the laws they've already got. And so that was all part of Biden's plan, pillar number one, understanding and sharing information. Pillar number two is they want to prevent us from organizing. Or put their way, they want to, quote, prevent domestic terrorists from successfully recruiting, inciting, and mobilizing Americans to violence, unquote. Now, one of the ways they want to do this is through some gun control. They say they want to reduce access to assault weapons and high-capacity magazines and enforce legal prohibitions that keep firearms out of dangerous hands, which is actually one here that makes some sense because it's hard to shoot up a building without a high-capacity weapon that can kill people real fast. So, fine. Biden's Department of Defense, though, is also planning to create a way for veteran snitches to report recruitment attempts by other veterans to their groups, groups like the Oath Keepers. Now, how they will distinguish between extremist veterans groups and other groups of veterans who have been sent to die in our wars for corporate profit who are justifiably unhappy with our government, that I do not know. Next, Biden's Department of Homeland Security is going to create digital programming to teach critical thinking skills and media literacy, and they're even designing games and a fun app. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see if Biden's disinformation game becomes the next Angry Birds. And finally, they want to prevent people from becoming domestic terrorists by, quote, reducing both supply and demand of recruitment materials by limiting widespread availability online, unquote which is a political weasel way of saying that they intend to conduct online monitoring and censorship. And in the wake of January 6th, the FBI is seeing opportunities for more power to be granted to it. So here's FBI Director Chris Wray testifying to the House on June 15th. As to social media, uh, I think there's a, there's a, it's understandable that there's a lot of confusion on the subject. We, we do not, we have very specific policies that have been at the department for a long time that govern our ability to uh, use social media. And when we have an authorized purpose and proper predication, there's a lot of things we can do on social media, and we do do, and we aggressively do. Mm -hmm. But what we can't do, what we can't do on social media uh, is without proper predication and an authorized purpose, just uh, monitor just in case on social media. Now, if the policies should be changed to reflect that, that might be one of the important lessons learned coming out of this whole experience, but that's not something that, that currently the FBI has mm -hmm. the uh, either the authority or certainly the resources, frankly, to do with me. But here we go again. So they're saying that they don't have the power to fully monitor social media. And so without the power that they want being granted yet by Congress, the Biden administration is moving forward by privatizing the things that they can't legally do. 
So for example, the Department of Homeland Security is considering hiring private companies to analyze public social media for warning signs of possible future peasant violence. Now this plan, I want to be clear, hasn't yet received approval or funding that I know of. But John Cohen, who's a top Department of Homeland Security official who used to work for AT&T and who is in charge of this project, considers recruiting the private sector to do what they're not allowed to do to be an important upgrade to the department's capabilities in social media analysis. But you know, at least with a program like this, they'd be monitoring the messages that we are putting out in the world and intend to be at least semi-public. But there are some messages that we go out of our way to keep private for reasons that are our own damn business. And so we use apps to encrypt those messages. Well, the Biden administration wants to be able to monitor those too. Here's FBI Director Chris Wray on June 15th testifying to the House Committee on Oversight and Reform. Among the things that we've taken away from from this experience are a few. One, uh, as you heard me say in response to an earlier question, we need to develop better human sources. Right. Because if we can get better human sources, then we can better separate the wheat from the chaff in social media. Two, we need better data analytics. Uh, the volume, as you said, the volume of this stuff is uh, is just massive. And the ability to have the right tools uh, to get through it and sift through it in a way that is, um, again, separating the wheat from the chaff is key. And then the third point that I would make. Uh, is we are are rapidly having to contend with the issue of encryption. So what I mean by that is, yes, there might be chatter on social media, but then what we have found, and this is, was true in relation to January 6th in spades, but it was also true over the summer in some of the violence that occurred there, individuals will switch over to encrypted platforms for the really significant, really revealing communications. And so we've got to figure out a way to get into those communications or we're going to be constantly playing catch up in our effort to separate, as I said, the wheat from the chaff and social media. They simply want access to everything we do in the digital space at all times in every location. And they intend to globalize the effort. So part of their second pillar of action is the Biden administration's endorsement of the Christchurch call to action to eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online. This is a voluntary, and that's important, it's voluntary, initiative that's named after the mass shooting that killed 51 people in two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, which was live streamed on the internet. In response, countries are banding together to request that internet providers prevent the uploading of whatever they consider terrorist content and prevent it from being shared by immediately and permanently removing it from the internet and by closing people's accounts. Governments and internet providing companies are supposed to, quote, work with civil society, unquote, so like NGOs, to promote counter messaging, so, you know, propaganda and to redirect users away from the content flagged as terrorist. And so that's more than taking down beheading videos. These partnerships go a step further by creating other content with the messaging that the governments and the companies want us to see. So pillar number two of the Biden administration's plan is to keep us from organizing by censoring the internet. It's so fucking 1984, and it's going global. Pillar number three after they spy on us and prevent us from organizing online, is that they are going to disrupt our crimes before we commit them. So they're going to go and stop the pre-crime. But how they're going to do this is thin on specifics. There's a lot in this section about sharing information between law enforcement agencies, and they want more funding, of course. But stopping crimes before they happen, again, that's impossible. And so I think if we want to understand where this pillar of disrupting activities is headed, We're best served by looking at the past, specifically the FBI's past. The FBI has a long, long history of infiltrating groups or even creating groups and having their guys suggest a terrorist plot, then fund it, organize it, and then right before it happens, they arrest all of the people in the group who weren't part of the FBI. I mean, it just happened again. Remember that whole plot that we heard about where white domestic terrorists plotted to kidnap Michigan's Governor Widmer because of her COVID-19 related policies? Well, did you know that 12 of the people, 12 involved in that were FBI informants? Some of them paid thousands of dollars and one even given a car. FBI informants organized the original planning meetings. 
FBI informants paid for hotel rooms, transportation, and food that were used to get people to go to those meetings. FBI informants organized and ran the training camps, which were being used as evidence of a sophisticated plot. Those FBI informants were also encouraged by the FBI to bring more people into those groups. And Governor Widmer knew all about the plot well in advance and was never in any real danger because the FBI was watching and participating in the whole thing. And now a bunch of dudes are in the middle of being prosecuted for crimes that didn't actually get committed because their activities were disrupted. Pillar number three, mission accomplished. And so I think pillar number three of the Biden plan is essentially going to be more of that. Because how else can you prosecute pre-crime if you don't have three future-seeing precogs in a pool to tell you the future? You have to disrupt the plots that you know about. And that's easiest to do if there are plots you are helping to engineer. And so, pillar number one, collect information on all of us. Pillar number two, prevent us from organizing. Pillar number three, disrupt our activities. And that leaves the last one, pillar number four, which is addressing the long-term issues to diminish the threats. Now, this one, the only one I actually like, the how about we actually solve the problems that Americans are pissed about one? Well, this, of course, is the one with the least amount of detail. They didn't discuss ending our military and State Department regime change efforts. They didn't discuss creating a healthcare system capable of adequately handling a pandemic. They didn't discuss enacting real voter protections and getting rid of systemic election rigging procedures like partisan district gerrymandering. They didn't discuss making bribery of politicians illegal or prohibiting our lawmakers from gambling on the stock market while in office while making laws governing the stock market. They didn't discuss any specifics for fixing the problems that have led to so many of us doubting the intentions and capabilities of our government. Instead, the most specific thing they said about addressing our long-term issues was that, quote, enhancing faith in American democracy demands accelerating work to contend with an information environment that challenges healthy democratic discourse, unquote. So the only specific solution that they had was more propaganda. And it's all so sad, you know, because January 6th, we examined what happened that day in the last episode after listening to 20 something hours of hearings about it and what led up to it. The conclusion that was clear was that we knew what needed to be done to prevent it. And we definitely know what needs to be done to prevent that from happening again. The Capitol Police needed to be prepared for the possibility that people would enter the Capitol building. They needed training and they also needed oversight. Well, in the law signed on July 30th, they got some training money, but the suggestion that we heard policy-wise, that hasn't been implemented, at least not to my knowledge. We were told the Capitol Police should not be responsible for their own training requirements. We were told that an outside organization should be creating and making them take recurring training programs throughout the Capitol Police officers' careers. But that's not mandated by any law. And we know that the Capitol Police Board served as a roadblock, an unnecessary middleman to authorizations needed to defend the building in the moment, but they still retain their middleman status. We also saw the repercussions of Washington, D.C. not being a state and not having the ability to call their own National Guard, instead having to get authorization from the president. Well, we were just confronted with a scenario where the president was the problem. And so it seems crystal clear that the D.C. mayor should be given the authority to call their National Guard. And there's actually two bills in this Congress that would do that. H.R. 657 and S. 130, so one in the House and one in the Senate, both of them titled the District of Columbia National Guard Home Rule Act. Well, both of those bills are identical and would give the Washington, D.C. mayor control of the D.C. National Guard, just like governors currently have control over their state National Guards. But neither of these bills has moved. And we've also heard, not just after January 6th, but for years now, in testimony over and over and over again, that the reason that people in America are being siloed into these rage-based political groups is because social media algorithms feast on rage. The more we comment on a type of content, the more we see of that type of content. And what do we tend to comment on? The shit that makes us mad. And so to keep eyeballs on their websites in order to profit off of selling us advertisements, Social media companies have rigged what we see on their sites. You know, Twitter isn't chronological anymore. 
And Facebook is a fucking disaster area. Who knows how they decide what to put in our feeds? Google prioritizes its own content above everybody else's. It's all a mess and it's all the algorithms. They are the problem. The problem isn't the ability for anyone to say what we think online. The problem is the outweighed influence, the rage-based voices, and the bullshitters who get a lot of comments on their posts. The problem is that they are rewarded by algorithms with space on more people's feeds. I've been studying this problem for a while now, and in fact, I'm living it. Congressional Dish doesn't get any algorithmic love, but Tucker Carlson sure does. He's corporate. He's a troll. You know, what's not for the algorithms to love? And so I think that if we stopped the social media companies from having the ability to create these secret sauce recipes for what we see, that could go a long way towards solving the problems of division that social media companies and search engines are responsible for without giving them the power to take down what we want to say. And in my research, I found a bill that I really like that would go a long way towards solving that problem. S-1896, the Algorithmic Justice and Online Platform Transparency Act, which was written by Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts. This bill was introduced on May 27th, and it would require online platforms that use algorithms to determine what we see. Well, it would require them to tell us what information they collect about us, how they collect it, how they use that information, and what weight they assign to each category to determine what we see. They would also have to submit reports once per year detailing what content they removed, how they made those decisions, who made those decisions. Was it robots? Was it employees? Was it contractors? Who did it? They also have to tell us the number of successful appeals of those decisions and how many government requests for content moderation were submitted and acted upon. I want that report. And that report would have to be made available to everyone who is required by the company to create a user account. So if you use Facebook, you would get to see that shit. And I think that that is fair. And on top of that transparency, the online platforms would also have to create a public, quote, advertising library, unquote, containing searchable copies of all advertisements that they distribute to us, how the ads were targeted, the name of the advertiser, and how much they paid for the ads. And that alone, that little bill all about transparency, I think that is a great start because sunshine is the best disinfectant. Although, you know, maybe I shouldn't say that because that's what Donald Trump told us would kill COVID. (laughs) But seriously, if they had to tell us how they filter what we see, we would have the power to tweak our own settings and we'd be able to organize and demand changes. We would know who is paying these companies and who is making their decisions. Knowledge is definitely power. And this bill would give us the knowledge we need to make decisions about what power these companies should have in our society. But this bill that I legit love, it also hasn't moved. And so the four pillars of Biden land, spying, corporate domestic sanctions, internet censorship, and more propaganda, that's the plan. And, you know, I know I've thrown a lot of bill numbers at you today, and I would hope that if you have feelings about what you heard in this episode, that you would be communicating those to your members of Congress and not just to me in the thank you episodes. So please remember the show notes and use the show notes to, again, check to see if you think I was fair in my assessments, but also to get those bill numbers and these documents so that you can use them when you act on the information. And if you value the information I've shared today, it's really important that you participate in the value for value model before I'm branded a domestic terrorist and these financing methods disappear. (laughs) I hope that's a joke. But I do need your help because I'm making some big investments in the future of Congressional Dish. So first of all, I am thrilled to tell you that I found my new assistant. So thank you to everyone who applied and interviewed last week for this gig. Literally every person I spoke to could have done a great job. And it was so fun getting to meet you and see some of your Zoom faces. And I just think it is so cool that I never even had to look outside of the green room for so many excellent candidates. But in the end, I just couldn't resist Claire. Claire has been a Congressional Dish producer for four years, and so she's been investing in this project for a long time and totally gets what we're doing here. And she's a librarian and an archivist who will be creating our show notes. 
And so basically, she's way overqualified, and I'm so excited to have her on the team. And I can't wait to see how the show notes transform for the better in her hands. And so welcome to the back end of the production facility, Claire. We are so happy to have you here. And producers, because I found a new assistant with potential for amazingness so quickly, I do think I should be back on track for two episodes in September, because God knows there's plenty for me to look into. And thank you to the producers who have kicked in some bonuses to help me make it through this one episode month while I dealt with that whole assistant crisis. And I will have a thank you episode for you guys next week. But on top of welcoming Claire to our team, some other really exciting things are happening on the back end that you'll get to see the results of pretty soon. One of them is that congressionaldish.com is almost done being redesigned. Because I have been aware for a long time that the website that I designed with absolutely no web design experience is an amateurish dumpster fire. And so I hired my friend Mark DeCoats to create us an easy to navigate website for hosting our show and the oh so important show notes. And this week I got my first sneak peek at what he's working on and I got to play with it and I'm so excited to share it with you guys. It's going to be a huge upgrade. And then on top of that, I'm also making a reinvestment in the editing team. I'm basically going to be handing off more of my busy work. I've been doing a lot of things by myself on the publishing side, and you don't need the boring details on that. But I am really excited to have more help for my incredible editing team. But I am also financially nervous about all of this. Basically, between the extra editing tasks that I'm paying for and my plans for improving the show notes... My production costs pretty much just doubled starting in September, and I haven't even paid for the website redesign yet, so I'm about to take that hit too. But I've been making these big moves on faith that the audience will support the show since the beginning, and you guys haven't let me down yet, and so I'm doing it again. Because the goal here long term is to make each episode even more valuable. And we have some really good ideas about how to do it. And so, yeah, I'm making investments in the show and I'm trying my best to eat the anxiety about the dollar dollar bills as best I can. But you can help with that part. The soon to be so easy to use support page on congressionaldish.com has all the options for you to help you ease my financial anxiety about making the show better. Basically, you have the ability to be my financial Xanax so that I can stay off the real thing. <laughs> And if you do that, it will be very much appreciated because I think with the extra help, I'll be able to make the production schedule more sustainable and have fewer of these one episode months because there's so much going on in Congress all the time. And I want to look into so much more of it, but I need to slough off the tasks that other people are capable of doing. And so this upgrade to our back end systems, I think will get us closer to doing that. And I've prepaid my housing for the next three months. And so I'm, I'm okay, but the funding needs to increase for these investments to be sustainable ones. And so please pay for the show. And thank you to all the producers who have helped take the show this far. I fucking love you guys. And on the list of now executive producers of whom I fucking love is Robin Thurkel. Now, Robin has been a longtime contributor to Congressional Dish, and she recently kicked in a $50 bonus. And with that bonus, she requested an executive producer credit. She's one of those people that has accumulated her credit over time. So this wasn't a lump sum, but she definitely qualifies. And she chose to put her executive producer credit on Congressional Dish 233 Long COVID. And along with that, she sent in an email. So her email said, hey, Jen and Lauren, I'm sending a little bonus on Zell with this note. I'm certain I can get a producer credit and I would like to use it for number 233 long COVID. I've been anonymous for a while, but I'm now actively networking to find nurse practitioners to hang with. So shout me out. And we do have nurses in this audience. So yeah, Robin needs friends. <laughs> she says she needs East Coast preceptors. That's a word I'm not familiar with. <laughs> so she's obviously smarter than me. But she says she needs East Coast preceptors for school starting in May 2022. She says the field is super saturated. And although I'm not worried about finding work when I'm done with school, I'm in need of preceptors for school. I'll toss this credit on my LinkedIn. Amazing idea. And on top of that, I will hunt down your LinkedIn and put it in this episode show notes. 
But Robin says that she is, and these abbreviations should mean things to medical people, but she says that she is an RN, BSN, and CHPN. She also says her specialty areas are hospice, palliative care, and gerontology, and she has been in healthcare since 2006. So essentially, I think she's an angel on earth because I just, I don't know how you guys do that job and I appreciate everybody who does. Back to her note, she said, in other news, you kick butt, ignore the haters. Oh, I'm trying, my friend. She says, you've had my quiet support for many years and I stay on the edge of my seat for new episodes. I was especially taken by the long COVID episode and more recently, the baby bouncer thing. People can really suck. Thanks for pointing it out and keeping me cynical. <laughs> well, that's not my goal, but you know, I think it's Congress that's keeping us cynical because I would love to report on happy news. It's just, it's really, really hard to find lately. Back to her note, she said, I will produce and provide expert-ish feedback to use or not on any health-related episode from here on out. Research and citations, that's the shit I do in grad school. Ugh, a girl from my own breed. She says, keep fighting the good fight. P.S. Tip your sister. Oh, honey, I do. Don't you worry. And she says, lastly, I have cute farm animals on Instagram. Her Instagram is flossies underscore farmstead. And so I will put that link in this episode show notes too. And she said her name is Robin Thurkill, Thur like Thursday and kill like murder. <laughs> so thank you for the pronunciation help too. But thank you so much for being an executive producer. I appreciate this so much. And it's always fun for me to see a name go on one of my episodes that I have seen over and over again for so many years. So thanks for helping me executive produce that episode. I'm really proud of it too. And honestly, it's still helping me to have produced that one because I'm understanding what is happening to people in a way that I don't think I would have had I not watched those hearings and produced that episode. I just feel like I learned so much about the long-term effects of this virus. I mean, so much is made of the death statistics, but I think the long COVID is actually what I am trying to avoid with my own precautions more than anything because... I like my sense of taste and smell, and I also need my brain. So <laughs> very informative episode, and I'm proud to, to share the executive producer line with you, Robin. Okay. So I am still in Pittsburgh. It is 10.30 p.m., and I have not had dinner, and I leave tomorrow morning. So it is now time for me to eat my dinner and pack and do all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to wrap this up. Thanks so much for listening. If you have feedback, send it in with your donations and we shall discuss everything from this episode next week on the thank you. All right. Thanks so much to all my producers. I, I, I love, love, love you. And I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. We don't have a domestic spying program. They're content to fight in black and white despite the many in between. We got a president who plays with the facts. With the facts. And then he waves a flag to cover his tracks. As if a lie is alright, in the end will justify the means. Now we are so damn tired of being. The polar ice caps aren't going away. We don't think we can deny it anymore. You can stick to your story if you think it lies. But we're not keeping quiet anymore. We are so damn tired. Government jobs consume the profits of the private sector. We don't think we can deny it anymore. bills represent common sense bipartisan solutions that actually solve problems.